Well, Colin Furness is probably familiar to most, if not all of you, as a frequent local and national media presence during this pandemic. His expertise as an epidemiologist has been featured in more than 1,000 interviews in the past year on CBC, CTV, TVO, radio and television, and in newspapers from the Globe and Mail to the New York Times and elsewhere. He has also been retained as an expert witness several times concerning COVID-19 emergency measures and public safety. Cullen is an assistant professor in the University of Toronto Faculty of Information, the, the I School, cross-appointed to the Dalalana School of Public Health perhaps an unusual confluence of academic specialties. But he earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Toronto in Psychology and Philosophy and his Master's degree in Information Systems Design, Human Computer Interaction from the iSchool. He worked for years in industry as one of the early information architects in New York's so-called Silicon Alley and later with a Toronto technology company in collaboration with Ontario Public Health and Hospital Agencies on research and, and projects related to disease transmission and infection prevention and control. He then earned his PhD in information knowledge management from the iSchool and a year later began teaching there subsequently earning a master's degree in epidemiology from the Dalalana School. In short, Colin's multidisciplinary design background combined psychology, human computer interaction, information and knowledge management and public health. His expertise and experience lie at the crossroads of effective design for information systems, collaborative knowledge, use in workplace settings and epidemiology. I would suggest that never have the relentlessly evolving facts and effects of knowledge, information, expertise been more critical to our everyday lives than during this pandemic. So we're fortunate today to have Colin Furness with us to speak on COVID-19, a crisis of expertise, Colin. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And I, I certainly hope the introduction doesn't turn out to be the best part of the talk. Um, I would love to go back and edit that I, bio, I think, and take out the word expert all the way through because part of really what I wanna talk about is I don't think anyone knows what that word means in COVID. And, and, and I think there's a few good reasons for that. So I don't think I should claim, I don't think I should claim that word. Um, if, I, if we do, I think I'd have to call myself a, a hapless expert, uh, an unwitting expert. Um, all of this started, uh, just if I can just sort of pr provide a little bit of background for that, in January when uh, one of my colleagues said there's a journalist who needs a question answered about something around the possibility of an epidemic. Uh, and I said, oh, sure, I can, I'm sure I could do that. And it, and it snowballed from there very quickly. In March, I remember saying publicly and to my family and to my friends, Ontario is the right place to be if we're going to have a global pandemic because we have expertise. One thing we have in spades is expertise, and we and so not only not only do we have good book expertise, we have actually have lived experience. We're going to nail this, and and it's going to be a joy to watch the triumph of public health. That's what I said in March. By April, I was starting to lose sleep because decisions that should have been made weren't being made, and some decisions that um, that were being made shouldn't have. And it started to feel to me like we were going into a very bad place very, very quickly. And I couldn't figure out why these decisions were being made. That's, that's what April was like for me. And I think in a sense, for me, that was maybe the most nightmarish month because there was something horribly, horribly wrong and I couldn't even put my finger on it. Um, by May, it occurred to me that I thought I was going to have to start saying things publicly because at this point I was doing commentary in the media who anointed me an expert, by the way, right? If I'm an, if I'm people think I'm an expert, it's because the media says so. And I'm not sure what their basis for judging that is, but my, my decision to use whatever podium I might have be critical of what we were doing. That was a really hard decision. Um, I don't think generally speaking, when you're involved in a war that, that best interests are served by 
trying to stop things and say, are we sure we want to do this? Are we should should we maybe stop and talk about it a bit? But um, but in this case, I, I felt that I actually really had to. That's been a pretty difficult path. Part of it, part of it being ignored, part of it getting hate mail, um, part of it kind of knowing how things were going to go and, and kind of having to suffer quietly with that. It's been pretty hard. Um, but rather than just wallow in self-pity, I guess what, what I really want to emphasize is that that led me to, in addition to talking a lot about how viruses work and how public health measures work, um, it's led me to think a lot about what do we mean when we say experts? And so this is the first time today in this talk is the first time I've actually gotten up uh, and said, let's talk about what expertise means. So I'm in a sense kind of trying out this thinking on you. Um, I, hope, I hope to be able to refine it. Um, but, but that's where I'm coming from, is, is sort of having to say, I think I need to attack the status quo. Who are the experts? What is expertise here? So uh, as Linda kindly talked about in my, in my introduction, um, I come from, on one hand, information and knowledge management and how organizations and individuals make decisions and think and create knowledge and, and make sense of things, how they process information, how they get smarter. Um, on, that's on one hand, and epidemiology on the other hand. And a few journalists have said to me, it's almost like you were preparing your whole life for this pandemic. And that's a pretty horrible thing to say. Um, uh, but but in, in, in hindsight, in hindsight, I think if, if I've got a lot of media attention, it's because there's not a lot of people at that confluence. And it gives me a perspective. I think I'm a mediocre epidemiologist. I think in my class, there are half of them, at least who could run circles around me. Uh, so if there's something I have, and I'm not sure that expertise is the right word, but if there's something I have, it's a perspective. I think that's a little bit different than your than your typical epidemiologist. So when I was asked if I could do this, do a talk, and I thought, well, okay, sure. Um, this gives me a chance to try and prepare something, present something, try and do something a little bit new. I, I started to think about, okay, how can I talk about broadly why we're failing? And how can I talk about that with expertise? And and I landed on, it took me a long time to draw, to draw up the abstract, actually, because I was kind of designing the talk in the abstract at the same time. And so in the end, I said, well, I think we could say there's three obstacles, a small one, a medium one, and a, and a, and a great big large one. The small one, and I'll, I'll explore that one first, um, is there's a reluctance to involve expertise in decision making. And that's actually a human condition problem. That's a human cognitive problem. It's definitely a Ford government problem. It's definitely a Trudeau government problem, no question, uh, and a Quebec problem. <laughs> and, and I think most provinces uh, share, share these characteristics, but it's, it's because humans can't handle complicated problems. Uh, and, and COVID is as complicated as it gets in, in my estimation. So I just want to unpack that briefly and I have a sort of a diagram to show you and then we can get past that and say, okay, so given that we have a hard time wrestling with expertise, do we even know what expertise is? I mean, what, what counts as expertise? There's a whole lot of different professions who can lay claim to understanding or being the go-to for uh, making sense of COVID. And there's not a lot of agreement between them sometimes and some really fundamental questions uh, we don't have a consensus on. And, and so that's, that, that's a problem, right? We can't just say, well, they're all experts. That's actually not helpful. We need some way to actually figure out what are the blind spots. And I think every profession has them. What are the blind spots that each profession has? And how can we then make sense of this cacophony together? That's a very different notion than listening to the experts. And I'll, I'll say that in finger quotes, listening to the experts, because that's, that's something we hear about a lot. And then the final obstacle I want to talk about is the one that actually I th in some ways troubles me the most because I think it's the hardest effects. And it's thinking about how evidence-based medicine works, which is an amazing evolution in how we deliver medical care, no question. Uh, invented, if we could call it invented, at, really at McMaster University. I mean, that's the global birthplace of evidence-based medicine about 30 years ago. Uh, so that's, that's not that long ago. And it's really revolutionized medicine and, and it's mostly good. But like everything, there's blind spots. And so I don't want to say that evidence-based medicine is bad, but evidence-based medicine has a blind spot and, and COVID fits in that blind spot. And I think it's useful to recognize that. It's not clear to me that we have easy fixes to blind spots. I've got some suggestions after we talk about these obstacles to what, what are some of the ways we might actually go forward. I don't mean in the few, next few weeks, I mean in the, in the next many years. I mean, what is, it, what is it we need to change about the, way we, about the way we think, about the way we manage expertise, about the way we regard it, and, and the way we train people and the way we train them to think. So I think there's some positive things we could think about how we can improve our way out of this in, in the long run. All right, so I want to start when I, when I talk about trying to simplify big problems and resisting expertise. Um, the, the, uh, the work of Herbert Simon, who 
is a, was an amazing uh, organizational theorist, proto knowledge management guy, I guess. Um, very, very, very uh, accomplished academic, and he came up with the concept of bounded rationality. And and so this is 1957, and this really replaces a very mechanistic view of the way humans think. Um, humans are not rational, computer-like decision makers. We are actually anything but. And he didn't go to the extremes that we discovered in the 70s and 80s with our judgments and biases and how irrational we are. He took the first step. And he said, you know, we pretend to be rational when actually all we're really doing is simplifying something until it's simple, simple enough for us to understand. And that's very different than applying a rational process. Let me just share my screen for a moment here, just to give you a picture of that. There's a picture of bounded rationality, right? So what it really says is you've got Cognitive limitations, you can't know everything. You've got information imperfection. The information available is incomplete. And you've got some kind of time constraint. So even if you could somehow overcome your limitations and your imperfect information, you don't have the time to do it. That sounds a lot like COVID, right? That it's new, it's novel. Um, what's not known about it is much greater than what is known about it. And it's urgent. Right? So what Herbert Simon really has to say is bounded rationality is we simplify it. We basically, we pretend that we have all what we need to make a decision and we do what's called satisficing. Uh, that's Herbert Simon's word. It's, it's, it's sufficing and satisfying all together. In other words, we come up with something that's good enough or something that seems good enough and something that seems good enough is usually suboptimal. When we're talking in the political sphere and managing COVID is, 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 is a political process, no question. We can actually add, oops, hang on a sec, should be something that shows up here. We can actually add ideology, that that's actually another input, right? And I'll come back to that idea in a moment. Uh, and that when we say satisficing, we actually need to think about what's politically acceptable. So those are, those are also filters that lead us to uh, a narrow and sub generally speaking suboptimal outcome, right? That's a very antiseptic intellectualized look at why COVID has gone so badly, but it's a, it's a start. And in a sense, I'm trying to let governments off the hook by saying, we all think that way. The big problem with COVID is um, that it is just so, so very, as they say, big and complex, um, urgent, um, and very, very novel. The piece of ideology comes into it when we imagine for a moment, well, I imagine for a moment, that we need to look very closely at our marginalized populations to understand how COVID thrives where it thrives. And um, people who are wealthy get COVID too. But if we want to control COVID, actually, we actually really need to look where it thrives the most. And that's in marginalized uh, environments. Ideologically speaking, Mr. Ford's government, in my estimation, can't recognize homelessness can't recognize the role played by convicts, can't see market farm workers. Even when it was on the front page of the papers, it was framed as a problem that farmers were having, uh, not a problem that mig migrant farm workers were having. And, and so there was, there was actually nothing done. We still don't have a provincial homeless strategy for COVID. Um, and it's not because homeless people are important, it's because this is how COVID spreads. Um, it spreads institutionally and it spreads among the people who work with them. Uh, and that's true, as they say, I, I listed a few different, different marginalized populations. There's a much longer list. Ideology prevents those from being visible. So in the case of COVID, uh, Simon's bounded rationality gets just one step worse, which is, which is some things just really can't be seen. In addition to, or we, we might say it's one of the cognitive limitations, but actually I'm unwilling to say that an inability to, to see marginalized people is a human problem. It's not. It's an ideological problem. So it's, it's a problem that, that, that some humans have. Uh, along with that, I would say that, you know, the, the difficulties we've had with long-term care homes and other marginalized population, it's not that they don't exist, right? The government has been paying very close attention to that, but they've been assuming that it's an easily solvable problem. And therefore, they've, they simply assume that simple fixes uh, will work. Right, so that's that's that Herbert. I think Herbert Simon explains very well um, why. Well, when we add in the bit about ideology, it explains very well why homeless people are invisible and long-term care home problems don't get solved. Right, that it's it's uh, really part of the same part of the same cycle. Okay, so in addition to the idea that we need to simplify problems, um, the idea that we might try and involve expertise, right, have advisors, right, that, that seems reasonable. Why don't you have advisors? That gets to be a problem too, and the or or, or it's you're you're essentially swimming upstream, right? So um, I'm going to show you another picture.
not this one because we looked at it, but this one. So this is what Russell Ackoff um, produced in, in 1989, and this was not considered a significant publication at the time, but it's something we see again and again and again. In fact, often goes unsighted, but that's the, the, the best citation that, that one can have is, is Russell Ackoff in, in that, this one paper. Uh, and what he really says is, look, there's a relationship between levels of understanding and that you've got on the very bottom data, right, which, which ordinary people can't make sense of. Like a spreadsheet of numbers doesn't actually tell you anything, except that you've got a bunch of data. That needs to be synthesized somehow in information. It needs to be made accessible. And so information, that second level, that's where most people inhabit. That's where most people hang out. I can conform data into information, and I can explain that to you. We have a little bit of a brick wall, though, when we want to get to knowledge, right? The idea of that information being processed into knowledge means it's being combined with other information and being combined with existing knowledge. In other words, to develop knowledge, you have to already have some uh, that you can then glue new things onto. And so that's why people talk about having information overload. No one ever talks about having knowledge overload. Information overload means that you're unable to know what to do with it all, right? You can't actually process it because you don't, you don't actually have the knowledge and the experience or whatever it is that you might need to, in, to put that information to use. That's why information piles up. Knowledge doesn't pile up, right? Once you actually know something, once you're able to make use of it, um, once you've been able to, to attach meaning to it, then you have endless capacity. And then ideally, you progress from knowledge to wisdom, which is not only simply understanding what's going on, but being able to do, make smart decisions that are involved by the knowledge that's predicated on the information that is derived from the data. That's, that's one way of looking what expertise is. It's not the only way, but it's one way. And so as you go up the pyramid, you end up with increasing effort increasing need for expertise and increasing meaning. And that means increasing, well, when I say increasing effort, more time, more effort is needed. So in other words, the more we try and move up this pyramid, the more we start to run into the problem of bounded rationality, that there is not the resources available, right? Cognitively, the cabinet of Ontario can't do this. In terms of information, it's just not all, all available. In terms of data, we're not collecting it. And why aren't we doing those things? A lot of it has to do with time. Here we can see where I would have it, right? So scientists move around data and knowledge very easily and they can actually go directly between them. Politicians are stuck in the information level, level so that they need, they, need to, they need advice from scientists above and below. And the, the wisdom piece, which I'll get to right at the very end, I'm just mentioning that now, is that that's actually a lot further away. If we were to draw this pyramid to scale, it would be really pointy. It would be very tall and pointy uh, because wisdom would be well, well above, above knowledge. That that's actually a, a different way of thinking, not just, not just a, natural, a natural progression. So politicians trying to make decisions are being either bombarded by experts above and below, experts with data and experts with knowledge, um, or they're ignoring it. And the outcome is the same either way. They can't make use of it. So that's, that's a way of thinking about how it's easy to say, well, the Ontario government needs to listen to advice. The Ontario government needs to listen to experts. Yeah, I guess that's true, except it, it doesn't have a structural ability to do that. And, and governments tend not to have a structural ability to do that. Um, that doesn't mean they can't, but again, COVID is particularly salient, it's particularly urgent, it's particularly complex, it's particularly incomplete. Like it's, it really is uh, a perfect storm of a situation where decision makers just can't involve experts effectively. They just can't. In the case of Ontario, there's also, I think, a choice not to. Um, so it's not an inability so much as it is an unwillingness and an, and an inability going hand in hand. And I think it can be pretty hard to it can be pretty hard to separate those two. Okay, so that's that's most of the heavy duty theorizing that I wanted to do today. Um, I want to sort of point to Mr. Ford's frequently saying, and I know I'm being Ontario centric, but that's where I am, um, and, and it provides such a compelling illustration of what I'm trying to try, what I'm trying to get at. Mr. Ford talks always about listening to experts, always, always, always listening to experts. And with a few journalists that I've talked to over the last many months, it's been very difficult to figure out who those experts are, that there's been no, no transparency. And what I started saying by around May is, I don't know what expert would attach their name to this decision, right? That I just, I found a, a real gap there. And so as, you know, as a result, we don't have, we're not using uh, surveillance and transmission control um, we're not under, we, we have got a very, very poor application of communicable disease understanding going on in, in decision making. Jurisdictions aren't learning from each other. 
we have successes in Canada. The Atlantic provinces tend not to come up in conversation. Um, they are a bit of an inconvenient truth, as someone else has once said. Um, they did a bunch of things right, but we're not actually systematically looking at that. That's a, that's a, that's a, real, that's a real problem. Um, bad decisions. Uh, Bad decisions seem to seem to really um, to really really loom quite large, and then people like me are ascending to the media as um, I'm often called doctor. Well, I've got a PhD, so I'm entitled to be called doctor. But when I'm introduced by a reporter as doctor, people think I'm a physician, and I, they're, they're not unaware of that. And it's it's not something I actually like to see because I don't I don't actually think that's very very helpful because I think it's muddying even muddying it even more. But if people call me an expert, it's because the media has called me an expert. Um, I've got blind spots too, and the problem is I can't tell you what they are. Otherwise, otherwise they wouldn't be. Um, so that leads me to then, you know, the 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 second big problem here, right? If we've established now that that political decision makers in COVID are structurally unable to really listen to expertise, um, what is that expertise? Who are they? Again, Mr. Ford talks about listening to experts. I remember very clearly early days listening to Health Minister Elliott say, well, when someone asked about well, who are the experts, and she looked a bit flushed and she said, oh, you know, people who, I wrote it down when I heard this, people who have experience with these sorts of pandemics. That's what she said, people who have experience with these sorts of pandemics. That's a real head scratcher because no one back last spring had experience with these sorts of pandemics, these sorts of pandemics. I mean, the whole phraseology of it. And I know it's easy to make missteps when you're talking, uh, uh, talking impromptu as she was, but no one challenged her on it. No one actually challenged her on it. Um, so there's a, there's a great theorist who talks about what expertise is. And he says, uh, his name is Andrew Abbott. He's a sociologist in Chicago. And he, his, his take on this is actually really quite interesting. He says, you're an expert. Um, he, he calls it professionalism, but, but, but he, really means, actually, he really means the application of expertise. He says, you're an expert if you can take your knowledge from one domain and abstract it and apply it somewhere else. So if you're able to actually transfer, abstract what you know from one domain to another, that's what makes you an expert. In other words, you're an expert because you're able to problem solve something you've never seen before or something you've never done before based on what you already know. So it's a very, it's a, it, 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 in the case of Abbott, because he's really talking about, and you're doing it in competition with other professionals, other experts, and whoever, whoever is most convincing essentially gets to win. Well, it's still an open I won't say battle because I don't think all these different experts think they're really fighting with each other, but to the extent they disagree, um, there's a lot of open, there's a lot of open turf there. If we think about how Ontario structured COVID, they put um, uh, experts, experts, now this is an increasingly difficult word to use, right, into different tables. There's the science table and there's the evidence table, there's the health table, and that actually didn't help at all as far as, far as I can see. Um, what it did was enact the idea that the experts are in a different room in a different place, and that and that they'll they'll come up with they'll come up with one one kind of recommendation or another. But there's again the problem: these experts don't agree. Um, microbiologists really strongly oppose rapid testing because, from a microbiology microbiology standpoint, these tests are not sensitive enough. They don't they won't catch every case. And for microbiologists, that's actually the worst thing you could possibly do is to misclassify someone as being infected or not infected. Um, physicians don't support rapid testing because testing for physicians is diagnostic, right? That's their, their view of testing. And these are all valid, right? Microbiologists are right. Physicians are right. The testing is for diagnostics. And so surveillance testing doesn't make any sense. Doesn't, doesn't actually make any sense. And physicians have only complained in Ontario when their diagnostic tests were being held up. That's the only time that they've commented as a body. Um, lawyers and policymakers say, uh, no, rapid testing is a, is a bad idea because it tends to constrain liberty and it's logistically difficult and there's a lot of obstacles to it. So you've got these four different, three or four different professions saying we really shouldn't do rapid testing. And because of that, the only tool we actually have in our arsenal is to lock people down, right? Because you can do it one of two ways. And South Korea showed us last spring, you can test your way out of this, you can do that. But you have to commit to mass rapid testing as a, not in the way that physicians do it, not in the way that microbiologists want to do it, not in the way that policy analysts want to see it done, but in a way that, well, some epidemiologists, certainly not all, some epidemiologists say, this is, this is what you need, this is what you need to do if you want to control transmission, not because we did it last week or last year, but because this would work. In other words, we're, we're applying some set of knowledge we have to an entirely new circumstance. 
and, and being able to then point to evidence in, in some places and say, but that's evidently not enough to win the argument because uh, there have been a few people like me uh, advocating for rapid testing for just about, not a year, but, but about nine months, eight, eight or nine months now, as loudly as we could. Um, and again, the problem is I have to shout over microbiologists and physicians and policy analysts and so on and so forth. What are the chances that a, uh, a policy decision maker, what are the chances that a politician are going to be able to hear that over the din, given everything I just told you about the difficulty incorporating expertise in decision making, that's on a good day. That's when all the experts agree. When the experts don't agree, we have a really, really big problem. But there's been no discussion, right, about what are the blind spots? What is it about some physicians that actually causes them to say things that are really contrary to public health? What is it about microbiologists that are actually preventing a lot of uh, transmission control? What is it? about lawyers and, and policymakers that really worry about forcing people to do this and, and, and what the implications are. Um, it, it, it's, it's compounded by a lack of transparency because there isn't any transparency in decision-making in government. There's also nothing we can even pick apart. So we're not even really given a platform. Um, experts, so-called experts, aren't even given a platform to be able to sit down and debate this in a way. And unfortunately, the media doesn't help with that. It's very rare that I have been involved in a conversation, a public conversation with people who are from different professions um, and talking about different, different perspectives. That tends not to happen. Why? It's inconsistent with the notion of expert, right? When you've got experts, the media are very happy and very relieved to hear that experts agree, right? That's, 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 that's typically how they, want, uh, how they want that to go. Fundamentally, and if I could say one thing that you remember from this talk, it's that the term expert feels like an objective moniker but it's actually entirely subjective. It's entirely subjective. They're an expert, people, someone's an expert if you believe they're an expert. And so when Mr. Ford says, I listen to experts, this to me is increasingly, um, increasingly makes, me, makes me cringe, uh, makes me terrified. He has no idea what that word means, but apparently neither do the rest of us, right? This is a much, much, much bigger problem. If the experts, and I should probably start using finger quotes, maybe I should have had a prop for that. Um, if the experts can't have a conversation about why we can't agree, why we differ on things, um, we're going to just continue to go around in circles and the decision-making process is going to continue what it does, which is to make decisions outside of any of that expertise. So that's the, that's the big second, second problem. Um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll just list three big open questions. I mean, if you, if you think this feels maybe like a bit like a tempest in the tea kettle, uh, I've got three big questions we still can't answer. Are aerosols dangerous? Right? How airborne is COVID? Are aerosols dangerous? A lot of people are flying around in airplanes, which suggests to me that they're quite certain that aerosols are not dangerous, right? Because you would only get on an airplane if you were fairly sure that aerosols aren't dangerous. Um, a lot of people say they are, a lot of people say they aren't. And which side of it you fall on depends on your blind spots. It depends on which kind of expert you are. It depends on that more than anything else. And we're not collecting the data we need to collect in order to, in order to answer it. Um, can travel be done safely? I'm not just talking about airplanes. I mean, travel period. Can travel be done safely? Um, as an epidemiologist, to me, the answer is absolutely not. There's, there's so much evidence that some people can travel safely, but travel cannot be done safely. Travel cannot be done safely. So by allowing travel, we're actually, we're actually committing ourselves uh, to uh, far more pestilent suffering and death um, because we, can't, we, we, we are unable to answer that question. Should we reopen schools? There are passionate people on both sides. And it's, it's, it's funny because, well, funny, funny, tragic, because the, the, I, I think I might be one of the only people, or maybe the only person saying this, is that's a hard question. That's a really complicated question. And the best thing you can do with really complicated questions is collect data, right? Is to, is to be empirical about it. In other words, when we opened schools in September, we should have started testing very aggressively in schools, very simply. And by the way, we can do very sensitive saliva-based testing. We don't need to put um, long probes up children's noses. We don't, we don't need to cause suffering in order to do widespread testing. Not, not needed at all, um, but we didn't do that. And we did a little bit of sporadic non-systematic testing in November. And of course we got mixed results that no one can agree on the meaning of. And again, how those results strike you depends very much on what profession you are. And even within a profession, 
the modeling epidemiologists are very different in perspective from clinical epidemiologists, and and they those two those two groups do not agree. These are three big questions: Are aerosols dangerous? Can travel be done safely? Should we reopen schools? Experts can't agree because we haven't been able to understand these as multi, or rather, I should say, interdisciplinary problems. Right? Problems that don't belong in one domain, and the the, the notion that we have. Um, experts in their own domains, go going deep in their own silos, but not being able to connect, to find the equivalent of the intellectual equivalent of mirrors, um, uh, and in, in order to be able to see where what what their range of vision is compared to what the range of, of vision of other kinds of professions are. Those conversations aren't happening at all. Can we fix that? Yes, and I, I, I think we can, not easily, not immediately. Um, but uh, what I wanted to get to then was my final, this seems to be missing a page, but I think I can manage. Uh, my final objection, which is the, or ob obstacle rather, which I think is the, the most worrisome. And to do that, I will um, show you my screen. Actually, before I do that, let me just introduce it. Um, Evidence-based medicine that I talked about at the beginning, um, when I named that third obstacle, is a great thing. Uh, there's no question it's a great thing. It, it would mark the transformation from experts learning what they learned and then making the rest of it up as time changed, as knowledge gets, out, gets outdated. That was the model of medicine up until 1990. And uh, it was Donald Schoen, the, uh, the great organizational theorist who really identified this around 1983. I think he published a book called The Reflective Practitioner that said, you know what? First chapter is the crisis in the professions. What he said was, you can't just say you're an expert because of what you learned decades ago and keep on applying that. Like the, the world is way too complicated and way too fast changing. And consequently, professionals are losing prestige. Abbott, the, the theorist around the idea of abstracting expertise, would say that professions are actually uh, possibly even doomed if they, if they let that happen. And, and so he talked about the, the need for reflective practice. But that's not what evidence-based medicine, evidence medicine gave us. Evidence-based medicine gave us the idea that the body of knowledge continues to change and you must continue to learn if you're going to stay relevant. And that makes sense, but it's got some limits. Let me show you what evidence-based medicine looks like. Missed that. Uh, I was going to show you that. Didn't show you that. Here we are. The quality pyramid of medical evidence. So this, they, they look a little bit different. I'm sorry, I, I seem to be addicted to pyramids today. Um, but you really have a, a very clear hierarchy, right? At the bottom are qualitative things, ideas, opinions, editorials, anecdotes, then things called case reports. Those are people writing about what they have seen, right? First hand in the field typically. And those are, doctors are trained to ignore those. You've got to ignore those. The only purpose for those are in order to inform uh, what are called cross-sectional studies, where you might do a moment in time, a survey or a measurement of something in a moment in time. And then you have what are called observational research methods, case control and cohort studies, where you're not doing experiments because you, you, there's certain things you can't do experimentally, like make people sick. Um, and then, but then you've got randomized control trials, which are formally designed experiments. And then at the top of the pyramid are assessments or evaluation of a set of randomized control trials, right? So this is what the pyramid of evidence looks like. And what it says is if you're learning to be a doctor, it says you should look for the systematic review because the systematic review will tell you really in the most reliable possible way or the most valid possible way, I should say both, um, what the state of the art understanding is. So they're considered absolute gold standard. It takes years to get from an idea or an observation, sometimes decades from an idea or an observation to a systematic review or a meta-analysis. And this is why it took so many decades to connect cancer and smoking, right? A lot of clinicians knew it. They knew it in the 1960s, right? They could see it, right? It was, it was pretty obvious to them who smoked and who didn't and what kind of outcomes they got. But that was at the bottom of the pyramid. And there's no acting on that until you get to the top of the pyramid. I'm not going to tell you this is a problematic pyramid. This actually works very, very well. It's not perfect. It has a flaw in that um, okay, a, few, a few flaws. First of all, it assumes that, um, that if you're being quantitative, um, that that means you're being valid. And, and often that's the case, but not always. So it's substituting this hard-nosed quantitative approach for as a proxy for validity. That is, do you, are you really talking about what you're saying you're talking about? There's publication bias. Um, negative results don't get published. So consequently, finding out that something is ineffective is much harder to find out than that something is effective. 
So this pyramid actually isn't straight. It's actually very lopsided, very lopsided. And that's something that's not shown, right? It looks like it's quite stable and solid and well-designed, but it's not. But here's the big one for our present purposes, really long time horizons. It's tragic that it took decades to connect smoking and, and lung cancer. Um, but it's also tragic that it takes months or years or many years to investigate uh, rapidly moving infectious disease. So my little note about Zika virus, which I meant to show up a little bit later on, um, Zika virus is a really good example of something that was actually managed in this nimble way through case reports, right? Someone wrote a case report saying, I've seen a couple of cases of microencephaly and statistically speaking, I should never see one in my lifetime. I've just seen two in the last three months. And someone else would write in, same, I've seen one of those too. Something is going on here, right? Those do not count as sufficient sample sizes to say anything at all, right? Not, absolutely not at all. And among the few scholars I know who are arguing that COVID is really not a big deal, they're saying when you look at the big picture, we don't see excess mortality. When you construct these big quantitative models, we're not actually detecting. We're not actually detecting COVID. COVID is non-event if you zoom out far enough to big quantitative models. But clinically, on a, on a case report basis or a case study basis, that's actually really gigantic. And so um, the reason why this makes me so worried is because it's unshakable. This pyramid is unshakable. On February the 10th, I read a report in the Guardian newspaper about a UK man who'd been in, in Asia and then visited friends and family in France and returned to the UK. He caught COVID. He was entirely asymptomatic. He gave it to a lot of people. Like he was one of those unfortunate typhoid Mary super spreaders, never felt ill in a day in his life, was identified as the index case, felt awful, awful about it, right? Who who could forgive themselves for the, for the harm they had caused? He didn't actually do anything wrong. He had no idea he was sick, absolutely no idea. I read that and I thought, we're all in big trouble because we've just started to deploy temperature sensors at airports and we've assured ourselves that this will keep us safe. This one case report tells me we're in trouble. It doesn't tell me what proportion are asymptomatic. It doesn't tell me, could only be 1%, could be less. It doesn't tell me anything that I would need to know in order to be able to measure the problem. But qualitatively, it tells me what the problem is. But medicine wouldn't notice this because it's way down at the bottom of the pyramid. The idea that this guy had that suggests that we should talk for a year or two about asymptomatic transmission. And then we should maybe try and take a quantitative approach to that. And then eventually we'll start to, to generate higher quality evidence. And that will take years. That will take years to do. The medical establishment today maintains that asymptomatic transmission is subclinical. That is, if it's asymptomatic, it's unimportant because the pyramid of evidence says so. And this is an enormously difficult thing to undo. I have the blessing of not having been trained as a physician because I can see this very easily. I think if I'd been trained as a physician, I don't think I would see this. So it's not about me being smarter, it's about the way I was trying to think, which is very, very, very different proposition, very different proposition entirely. So because I was a social scientist before I got into biomedical science, the bottom of the pyramid to me is enormously important. We can learn a lot from case studies, from single case examinations. They can tell us that something is actually possible, right? In the case of the UK man, they told us something really important. Didn't say how much, but we don't need to know how much at, right away. We simply need to realize that this is a problem, then we can start measuring it. Had we recognized asymptomatic transmission as a problem, we would have started doing surveillance testing. We would have started testing people, not because they look sick, but because they are at risk. Had we done that, we would be in an entirely different uh, place today. So that is, this is the one I worry about the most because this pyramid, again, is a very stable geometric structure. It's a very stable scientific structure. It's a very stable um, political structure for that matter. And it's difficult. I've talked to, I have talked to public health physicians who have been critical of statements that I have made about testing, pointing out false positives. We should not do... COVID testing in the community because we might identify some people as having COVID when they don't. And that, of course, might cause some upset, which it would, and some um, and, and having them isolate themselves and take precautions needlessly and, and lose livelihood needlessly. And, and, and those are all true. But the concept of the false negative in this case is much, 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 much worse. And so it's that, it's that adherence to the pyramid of evidence and the way one is trained in testing theory that says we should, we should limit testing, right? The, the, the medical evidence pyramid says you limit testing. 
that you cause more harm than good when you do too much testing. And that's true for chronic diseases. It's true for a lot of things. It's just not true for a disease that yielded the UK man who I read about on February 10th. That's the, that's the problem that turns it all on its head. And the, 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 the concept, the paradigm of evidence-based medicine makes it impossible to say, yeah, but what about this? And that's a really big problem. The Zika virus was managed entirely at the bottom of the pyramid, right? It was discovered, it was detected, it was really smart collaboration. It mostly stayed in the global south. It mostly didn't get into having to affect global north economies. The big political decision-making process, process around what to do about this didn't kick in so much. It's important to note that the U.S. Congress never actually, as far as I know, never actually allocated money for this. They, they, they didn't actually get to the point of being able to do that, right? So the CDC in the U.S. was saying, we've got Zika virus in Florida. It could move north. And Congress wouldn't authorize money. They might have authorized some eventually, but it was one of these things where you kind of couldn't believe what you were reading in the paper. But actually, I think we have a really clear explanation for that, right? A very, very clear explanation for that. The evidence pyramid does not allow that kind of uh, decision-making to happen easily because it takes years in order to generate the kind of evidence to satisfy people who are trained to, uh, to think along the lines of the pyramid. Okay, enough with the pyramid. So I just wanna conclude what I have to say around these three obstacles by saying, I, I, I guess I could stop now and say we're hooped. Um, we, we're doing it all wrong and we're gonna keep doing it all wrong. In the short term, I believe we are gonna keep doing it all wrong. I don't see how we could change what's going on and it's not just an Ontario problem or a Canada problem. Governments all over the world have been failing at COVID um, needlessly, but failing nonetheless. I think it would be a mistake to say that it was inevitable because it's happened almost everywhere. I don't believe that. I don't actually really strongly don't believe that. Uh, so in the short term, I don't have a lot to say that's really positive. Um, in the longer term, I think we, we, we need to have a pretty serious conversation about expertise in public health and what expertise looks like and what, uh, what, how we can we frame public health problems as an interdisciplinary problem. Who needs to sit at that table? The difference between a team of experts and an expert team is actually what's important here. Anyone can assemble, assemble a team of experts, and that is certainly what Ontario did. Uh, several teams of experts. An expert team is one where the team works together. In other words, everyone understands what they bring to the table and what they don't and what everyone else brings to the table. So instead of competing perspectives, you've got something entirely new, right? That, uh, an expert team can produce work uh, that a team of experts can't. An expert team can ask and answer questions that a team of experts can't. So it's actually very, very big, very, very different. We need to think about switching from applying evidence from the pyramid to generating evidence in order to answer hard questions because that's what an expert team would do. An expert team would look at the situation and say, here's a list of evidence we need to generate. We need to test in schools. We need to do air sampling, right? We need to actually, we need to do uh, universal testing among travelers. If we wanna answer those really hard questions, those three ones that I said are open right now, we actually need to do that. We need to switch from applying evidence to generating evidence. The number one rule in outbreaks, which uh, is rarely quoted, but there is one number one rule, make it stop. Make it stop. That's the number one rule in preventing outbreaks. We've actually forgotten that. Evidence-based medicine has paved that over because you can't make that rule number one rule and adhere to the evidence-based medicine pyramid at the same time. It, they're incompatible with each other. Make it stop means improvising. Make it stop means trying things on the fly. Make it stop means going out on a limb. It means doing pilot projects, but most of all, it means collecting evidence, collecting evidence and acting on that evidence and doing that in real time, doing that very, very quickly. We could have known back in September what the risk in schools were. We could have developed a perfect understanding of that back then, but the expert team that, asked, that would need to ask the right questions that would need to collect the right data, that doesn't exist because we don't do expert teams, right? We have experts, we don't have expert teams. So I think we have to start thinking differently and I think we need to do that in public health. And I'm gonna lay that one on Public Health Ontario. That's where that thinking needs to happen. Uh, do they have the capacity to do that? I do not know, but I think that is where that, is where that needs to happen. Um, and the second is to then swim further upstream and say, if we want people in public health to think this way, we actually need to, we need to teach them to think this, this way. We need to actually get them to understand um, the complex problems need to be framed in interdisciplinary terms. When microbiologists look at testing and say, let's not do rapid testing, they're framing it in microbiology terms. If we train microbiologists to say, wait a minute, there's about six different people we need to put around the table so that we know we're asking the right question, and then we can come up with an answer, right? Individual experts should not be trying to answer those questions except with other 
uh, or, or with appeals to, to, to increase expertise around the table. Going back to political decision-making and, and bounded rationality, experts who understand each other are actually able to transcend bounded rationality, right? They have enough knowledge. They're able to grow up that knowledge pyramid. Um, they're able to do that because they actually already have knowledge. In other words, they're not subject to the same, to the, to, to the same constraints. So we can do that. Um, the late Scott Reeves wrote a book on interprofessional communication and barriers there, pointing out for the first time that different professions within a hospital just physically don't talk to each other. They're so siloed they don't talk to each other. Uh, we could, uh, we could uh, solve and prevent a lot of problems in hospitals if those professions actually developed a common vocabulary. That was, that was his idea. He, he died far before his time, and unfortunately, I don't think his work has really been extended. Um, which is which is which is a real shame but this needs to be in curriculum this needs to be in the scientific curriculum there's there's no question we need to be teaching scientists that they have to start thinking about how to frame things in interdisciplinary ways that's not a substitute for being an expert um, or developing expertise but it's a way of actually thinking about problems and engaging with other people who are able to see your blind spot who are able to hold up that mirror I think that's that's extremely important. So whereas we talk a lot about problem-based learning in the academy, we should be talking about interdisciplinary problem framing, right? Which is, I think is taking it to a, a far level. The last thing I want to um, uh, suggest that we could do is to turn back to Donald Schoen, who I'd mentioned some time ago as having identified the crisis in the professions. And you know his solution is called reflective practice. It's not dissimilar to what I said about wanting to change public health from applying evidence to generating evidence. There's two kinds of reflection and practice, or reflection and practice, or reflective practice, sorry, that Donald Schoen advocates. One is called reflection on action. That is to say that someone who's really smart, someone who may be able to call themselves an expert, uh, not only embraces interdisciplinary problem framing, but they're actually constantly measuring what they're doing and the impact of that. They're constantly assessing and evaluating and measuring. In other words, all their attention is not just on problem solving, but continuous learning to problem solve. That's a way of thinking, and it, it doesn't come naturally to most people. I have occasionally met natural reflective practitioners who constantly are figuring out how to improve their, their surroundings, how to improve their problem space, uh, not as not as busy bodies making suggestions, but they're actually thinking analytically and actually trying mini experiments and actually getting better at what they do. They're kind of like four leaf clovers. They're out there. They're hard to find. I think we could teach this. I think we could teach this. Um, I do at the Faculty of Information a, a graduate course in um, what I call the emerging professional. I'm not teaching them domain knowledge. I'm teaching them how to think about themselves as professionals. And some of that is how you, how you walk and talk and how you look. But actually, a lot of it really has to do with understanding what are your opportunities and obligations around the way you think, right? Or how do you deal with autonomy and judgment and decision making? How do you compete with other professions? And how hopefully will you embrace interdisciplinary work with other professions? I think there's a lot still to be done there. I think I'm a relatively lonely voice in not just talking about reflective practice, because a lot of professions talk about that, but actually connecting it to the bigger problem of when you turn out specialists, when you educate specialists, people who are experts, again, in finger quotes, experts in the one area, we should, we should really think about not calling them experts until we can somehow certify them as being able to do interdisciplinary um, problem framing in terms of being able to do reflection on action and in terms of switching from applying evidence when necessary to generating it when they need to. So that's, I hope, not too depressing a walk through what I see as, a, as COVID best understood, not as a biological problem, but an information problem, or more specifically, a crisis of expertise. So thank you for your, uh, for your time and your attention. Okay, thank you, Colin.